All right. What's poppin', my fellow brothers and sisters? Welcome. I think we're live. If my we fellow brother thing going. We got this thing going. Hope everybody's doing good, wherever you are. Hope you're having a good day, night, evening, morning, wherever you are in this age, this age of Kali Yuga. That's where we're in, man. We're in the midst of it. We're in the thick of it. We're in the matrix, one may say. I've, I've said it plenty of times, but I'm going to say it again because we're in it. We're in the thick of it, man. And they predicted this thousands of years ago. The age of Kali Yuga, the Dark Age, the Iron Age. We're in it, man. We're in it. It's easy to see. It's quite easy to see. And that's the, uh, that's the topic of today's video, man. We're going to go over um, a general, a general, um, uh, I guess the premise of Kali Yuga, a, a good summary of what Kali Yuga entails, right? What was prophesized in the Srimad Bhagavatam? Um, it's quite accurate, to be honest with you. I think it was, I don't know when the book was written, to be honest with you, but it was a long time ago. It was not, <laughs> it was not in 2023, and I think it does a very fair job of describing the time that we live in. Um, so yeah, I found a, a, a site called popularvedicscience.com, and it gives a very 101 overview of Kali Yuga, so I figured we can explore this together and uh, shed a little light in the age of darkness that we live in because you know even though it's dark it's bleak it's grim it's chaotic there's still hope there's still hope for us that are seemingly caught in this age of darkness so with, uh, without further ado let's get right into this thing man here we go so this is from popularvedicscience.com we are currently in the midst of Kali Yuga. I've said that already. <laughs> Kali Yuga began approximately 5,000 years ago in 3102 BCE at the end of Dwarpa Yuga. So for anyone that doesn't know, which most likely if you're watching this video, you probably do know, I'm probably preaching to the choir on this, but um, the Vedas describe time not as linear, but as a cycle. Time is a flat circle. Bonus points for anybody that knows what TV show that's from. So. It is described as time being in different sections and yugas like this. Different, uh, kind of like a pie, <laughs> in a way. It's the pie of time. Kali Yuga, thankfully, is the shortest. And they say it's millions of years. Okay, this isn't just centuries. This isn't decades. Millions of years. Now, I don't know how accurate that is. I don't know how really they came up with it. You know, I think it all has to do with astro, astronomical, um, astronomical rhythms and astronomical, uh, you know, different, different ways of the the cosmos that they somehow came up with this. You know, different dances of the different stars that they somehow base this uh, cycle of time on. Um, I'm not gonna try to even explain it, but I think that's how they based it off of. Or maybe they just got some kind of divine download. But they say it's uh, the yugas are millions of years long. Who knows? Who knows? All I know is how they describe Kali Yuga is very accurate to the time that we're living in. So, yes, Kali Yuga, 0.864 million. Treta Yuga, 1.728 million. Dwarpa Yuga, 2.592 million. And Sati Yuga, which is supposedly the best one. That's the golden age. That's the good times. Thankfully, is the longest one, 3.456 million years. So here's a little graphical representation. Like I said, we're in here, we're in the red, but hey, you know what? Good times ahead of us, okay? And it's a, it's a long time. It's a long time we're going to be in the good times. We just got to get through the got to get through the shit first. We got to get through the darkness. So, <clears throat> general overview. After Dwarpa Yuga comes Kali Yuga, the age of darkness, when spirituality is eclipsed by selfishness and dogmatic materialism. Uh, yep, that's what we're in. While Sri Krishna remained on the planet, Kali Yuga could not begin. The reason is that the presence of the Supreme Person keeps ignorance and irreligion at bay. As the Vaishnava poet Krishna Dasa has written, um, I don't need to read the Sanskrit, you guys can read that. 
but in English, Krishna is compared to sunshine, and Maya, illusion, is compared to darkness. Wherever there is sunshine, there cannot be darkness. As soon as one takes to Krishna consciousness, the darkness of illusion will immediately vanish. Remember that. We're going to get into that a little bit later and go over that point, because that point is very, very important. As soon as one takes to Krishna consciousness, the darkness of illusion will immediately vanish. That's the good news. That's the good news, man. However, shortly after the departure of Sri Krishna to his own realm in the spiritual sky, he left us, man. He was like, I'm out. Peace out, y'all. Peace out, Earth. Kali Yuga broke out in full force. The social order was turned on its head. Instead of educating and protecting the pop place, religious and political leaders abandoned virtue and became the chief criminals in society. The Vedas described many events of Kali Yuga in great detail. I'm going to open that up on another tab. Maybe get into that. Major events of Kali Yuga. Um, da, 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 da. You know what? Mm, might have to save that for another time. This is a little much. We'll stay on this one. We'll stay on the 101. <clears throat> In Kali Yuga, or the Iron Age, spirituality and morality are diminished to shadows of their former selves. Deception and hypocrisy in the name of religion is the status quo. The only process of dharma that is practiced and effective is nama sakutana, which is, some may know as kirtan, or chanting the names of God, especially the maha mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Nama, Hare Hare. As the dark age, Kali Yuga is the polar opposite of the golden age, Sata Yuga. During Kali Yuga, the world is virtually devoid of peace. All living beings suffer material hardships as they struggle to simply survive, be being deeply afflicted by fear. It's a beautiful write-up. In Kali Yuga, people live up to 100 years. The Bhagavata Purana describes human beings of Kali Yuga as follows. In this Iron Age of Kali, Men almost always have but short lives. They are quarrelsome, lazy, misguided, unlucky, and above all, always disturbed. Always disturbed. Doesn't it seem like everybody's always disturbed? You know, always perturbed on something, man. Something's always going on. <laughs> always disturbed. <laughs> Don't need to read that. So when will Kali Yuga end, right? When are we going to get through the darkness? Or at least, you know, on an astronomical sense. Kali Yuga started just over 5,000 years ago in 3102 BCE when Krishna left our planet Earth and it will last another 400, yeah, 427,000 years. After Kali Yuga, the Yuga cycle begins again with Sata Yuga, the Golden Age. This transition takes place with the assistance of Kalki Avatara, who rides the earth of the hordes of beast-like human beings who have lost all sense of their humanness. Then a small handful of sages and ascetic kings emerge from their hermitages to repopulate the earth and commence Sata Yuga again. Now this describes it as lasting another over 400,000 years. I don't, I find that hard to believe and maybe that's a little egocentric in, in because you know I'm living, we're living in Kali Yuga, and it's just the beginning. Like I just don't see it as lasting another four hundred thousand years. I don't see the Earth lasting another four hundred thousand years in the way that in you know in the trajectory that we're going. So I I don't I'm you know I don't like to doubt the uh, the holy books, but maybe maybe the time period's a little off. You know I like the description of Kali Yuga, but maybe just maybe the time period is a little off. I think it is. I think it's ending soon, to be honest with you. <clears throat> so these are some of the avatars in Kali Yuga, the holy men, or women, or people, you know. According to many researchers, Kali Yuga began, uh, we already read that, 3102, with the dis disappearance of Lord Krishna from our planet Earth. Krishna was the final avatar of the Dwapara Age. Unlike other incarnations of the Godhead, Krishna is the fountainhead, or source of all avatars, known in scran Sanskrit as the Avatari. The Vedic scriptures contain elaborate descriptions of the avatars of Kali Yuga, which are manifestations of the Supreme Being. Okay. In the first avatar of Kali Yuga, Krishna manifests in a literary form as the text known as the Bhagavata Purana. So literally, he's a book. 
This is documented within. And this is where this is where the information comes from. It comes from that book. This is documented within the text itself. <laughs> Sage uh, Shanaka Shaunaka inquires from Sutta Goswami how the people of Kali will be able to attain enlightenment in self-realization now that Lord Krishna has departed from the planet. Sutta replies. Now this is the good news, right? I'm not going to read the Sanskrit. Y'all can read it yourself. This Srimad Bhagavatam is the literary incarnation of God, and it is compiled by Srila Vashadeva, the incarnation of God. It is meant for the ultimate good of all people, and it is all successful, all blissful, and all perfect. Okay? Read the book. <laughs> Recite the mantras. This Bhagavatam Purana is as brilliant as the sun and has arisen just after the departure of Lord Krishna to his own abode, accompanied by religion, knowledge, etc. Persons who have lost their vision due to the dense darkness of ignorance in the age of Kali should get light from this Puruna. All right? By reading the Sri Bhagavatam, anyone can gain realization, direct realization, and experience of the presence of God. The Bhagavatam Purana is unique among all Puranas and scriptures of the world because it explicitly describes the Supreme Personality of Godhead, His name, form, activities, associates, and so on. Whereas other scriptures include instructions of saints, messiahs, and prophets, the Srimad Bhagavatam contains direct instructions from Krishna Himself, as well as numerous descriptions of Krishna's eternal activities in His own spiritual realm. Now maybe, maybe that's a little biased. Maybe. You know, maybe it's a little biased toward their way of seeing it. I, I believe that the truth is one and the wise call it by many names. So you can get this, this so-called um, direct realization experience in the presence of God, I believe, from other scriptures as well. Um, this is just one of many. A very effective one. One that is very profound and exquisite in its, uh, in its information. Very long as well. <laughs> So this is one of the, this is interesting, this is one of the incarnations. It's Buddha, man. Then in the beginning of Kali Yuga, the Dark Age, the Lord will appear as Lord Buddha, the son of Anjana, in the province of Gaya, just for the purpose of deluding those who are envious of the faithful theists. This is interesting, right? The next avatar in Kali Yuga is Buddha. Buddhism has become one of the most popular religions in the world. Though it is technically, technically not a theistic way of life, in his teachings, Lord Buddha makes no mention of God, the soul, or afterlife, and instead prescribes his followers a, pa a perfect path for living peacefully in this world. One might wonder why an incarnation of God would teach a non-theistic doctrine. The reason is that during this time in the world history, at the onset of Kali Yuga, many irresponsible priests and religious leaders were deliberately misinterpreting scripture in order to condone rampant animal killings and other forms of violence. And many other things, that's for sure. Therefore, Krishna descended in the form of Lord Buddha to teach ahimsa, or nonviolence, as the foremost principle of good and noble life. Now, I think that's very important, right? Because that's so true. Buddha teaches that God doesn't really matter. You know, this direct experience doesn't really matter because it's, if you do ascribe to this idea of God, which is a very weighted word, we all know. If you do ascribe to that, you might get lured into people that are using it for their own, for their own good, and essentially luring into somebody else's dogma, somebody else's view to control you and get you sucked in and get you uh, lost in the sauce, essentially, right? Which is represented perfectly by most of the uh, major religions, the popular ways to conduct ourselves spiritually in today's world, i.e., Catholicism, Islam. Judaism. I don't really have to go over them. We all know what I'm talking about. But they all they all conduct their activities in the name of God, right? It's like they took over the the essence of God to control people for their own for their own um I don't know, way to get rich maybe, to gain influence, power, control. Uh, it was ever more so during the times of like the medieval ages too. You know, people would look up to the pope as a leader, almost like a second god. <sighs> so that's why Buddha is valuable, man. Because he teaches he teaches pretty much the word, the way to live of God, but without using um without using and prescribing one to the 
idea of God that is related to dogma. You know, it's like to be how how to become godly without even without even using the terminology of God. Because I think that's what's the most important thing. It's like the what would Jesus do prescription without even talking about any of that. I think that's very important. Because it really doesn't matter if you, you know, find God per se. It's really just if you, you, it is important if you find that, but not in the way that others would prescribe it, not in the way that popular spirituality would prescribe it. Outwardly, inwardly. Lord Buddha teaches how to find this this God sense inwardly without even having to even say it, say God, right? That's the most important thing, how to find that inwardly. And that's why his teachings are so, so poignant, so relevant, especially today. Now, Lord Chaitanya, right? Known alternatively as Goranga Chaitanya and Mahu Prabhu, this golden avatar of Krishna is special among all others. Why? Because whereas most avatars exhibit a, a merely a portion of Krishna's godly qualities, Lord Chaitanya is a direct manifestation of Krishna. Among all grades of avatars, Chaitanya is in the highest class. Mahaprabhu appeared in West Bengal, in the, in the district of Nadia. Forgive me if I uh, pronounce these wrong. On February 18th, in the year 1486, now that's pretty recent, he appeared just over 500 years ago. There are still many biographies of him to available today. His parents were Jagannath, Misra, and Sachi Devi, and they gave him the name of Vashvimvabara, or the one who maintains the world. The reason Krishna appeared as Chaitanya Mahabharu, Mahabrahu, Prabhu was to broadcast a simple process of self-realization known as Bhakti Yoga, or devotional service in particular. Chaitanya taught the process of Nama Sankirtana, or chanting the names of God. Chanting is such a wonderful and potent path to enlightenment that anyone can do it, even a child, and experience the profound results in no time. Lord Chaitanya primarily taught that th that the essential teaching of all the Vedic scriptures is to know and love God. Lord Garanga, Garanga was also known for her social reformations. He pioneered the tactic of nonviolent protests, ahimsa, and he accepted all classes of men and women in his Sankirtana movement, unlike the arrogant class of conscious priests of his time. And that's exactly what the Buddha was doing. You know, going against the conscious priests, not conscious, but the, the ones that use the word God in their own, uh, the, they use the word God to in their own benefit. Right? The outward idol sense of God. Now, I think this is important, right? Because this is just Nama Sankirtana is Kirtan, right? And he says, as long as you repeat the name of God, which is Rama, Hare Krishna, Hanuman, it comes, the name comes in a lot of different ways. And that's how one can find themselves and find the light in the darkness of Kali Yuga, right? That's the good news, man. That's how easy it is. Is you just have to remember and I don't personally believe that you have to do kirtan. You know, you don't have to repeat the names as a mantra. It's definitely effective. But I think whatever one has to do in order to tap in to that remembrance, that's really all you got to do. Chaitanya gave us the way of kirtan, which is simple, right? I think that's why it's important it's because it's simple. And he's, like they said, anybody can do it. If you have a voice, you can do it. <laughs> if you can speak, you can do it. And even if you can't speak outwardly, I think we can all speak inwardly. You can chant these names inwardly. Whatever it is. And it doesn't even have to be a Sanskrit name. You could probably even chant Jesus. You could, you could pray. I think kirtan, the essence of kirtan is like, you know, it's, it's, it's literal singing. It's the repetition of these names of these holy names in order to remind us that we are connected to these holy names. We are part of the current. We are part of the song, we, the, the Bhagavad Gita. We are part of the song of God, right? I think that's what Kirtan is meant to, uh, meant to, meant to be as, is a reminder for all of us. No matter where we are, we could sing. 
<laughs> no shame, right? No matter where we are, we can sing. But you don't, I don't think you have to sing. I think it's whatever you have to do, whatever you got to do to remind yourself of your own divinity. Whatever it is, man. Kirtan's effective, like I said. But whatever you got to do to get into this moment, to feel the sanctity of this moment, to feel how special this is, to feel the connection, the thread to God. Singing definitely is there. It's, it's, if you guys haven't, which most likely I'm preaching to the choir here, but if you guys haven't tried chanting, repetition of mantras, highly recommend it. It's very effective to ground oneself back into the moment, to be here now. That be here nowness, that isness, that I amness, is easily touched upon with mantra and kirtan, right? But I don't think that that's all you need. You, whatever you got to do, man. You know, it could just be writing, uh, you know, you could connect to God by writing in your diary, writing a song, a poem, creation, whatever it is, man. Whatever gets you here and now and out of the distractions, out of the noise of Kali Yuga, the darkness, whatever shines a light to that inner kernel of divine consciousness that we all have within us. Whatever one has to do, you get, that's what you got to do to get through the darkness. It's like a constant remembrance, a constant reminder. I use the breath, but the breath is associated with kirtan. It's associated with singing, you know? Whatever you have to do, man. Whatever you got to do. That's the good news, right? If there's so much darkness, there's so much chaos, there's so much just calamity that we live in. But yet, it's so simple to see through that. It's so simple. All you have to do is remember that all of this, all of this is a distraction, all, anything, the happenings, the drama of our life, the stories, the narratives. It's all a distraction. Because truly deep down, truly deep down, we are connected to this divine essence. Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. That is us. So whatever you got to do, man, Kirtan, it's there for you. But it's not the only thing. It's not the only thing. So now we move on to Lord Kalki. This is where it gets a little saucy, man. This is where it gets a little hairy. At the end of Kali Yuga, Krishna descends in the form of Lord Kalki. A fearsome, a fearsome incarnation. My Boston accent came, in, came out on that one. A fearsome, a fearsome incarnation. Who kills the savage, cruel leaders. Who kills the savage and cruel leaders who have come to dominate planet Earth. This is described in the Srimad Bhagavatam as follows. By the time age Kali ends, the bodies of all creatures will be greatly reduced in size. And all religious principles of followers of Vara Nashrama will be ruined. The path of the Vedas will be completely forgotten in human society and so-called religion will be mostly atheistic we're getting there we're definitely getting there the kings will mostly be thieves the occupations of men will be stealing lying and needless violence and all the social classes will be reduced to the lowest level of sudras sudras is like the i mean there's like different caste right in the indian society sudras is like the lowest so everyone's going to be living in uh, depravity. You know, like kind of like everyone's going to be living in uh, a sense of homelessness in a way. Sense of lack. Even if it's like in the mind, a sense of lack. Opposite of abundance, right? Cows will be like goats. <laughs> Cows are revered, right? In the, in, in the Indian way of life. Spiritual hermitage will be no different from mundane houses. And family ties will extend no further than the immediate bonds of marriage. 
Most plants and herbs will be tiny, and all trees will appear like dwarf Sami trees. Don't know what that is. Clouds will be full of lightning. Homes will be devoid of piety, and all human beings will become like asses. <laughs> Y'all gonna be a bunch of asses. At that time, the supreme personality of the Godhead will appear on earth, acting with the, prop, the, the power of pure spiritual goodness, and he will rescue eternal religion. There it is. Lord Vishnu, the supreme personality of Godhead, the spiritual master of all moving and non-moving living beings, and the spiritual soul of all takes birth to protect the principles of religion and to relieve his saintly devotees from the, rec the reactions of material work. Lord Kalki will appear in the home of the most eminent Bra Brahmana of the Shambhala village. Now, I don't think that's an actual village. I think that's like some kind of... I don't know. Because we all know Shambhala, right? Shambhala is this like ethereal, otherworldly, almost heaven-like mansion world. It's Shambhala. He's going to appear in Shambhala. I think that's more of like just a, a saying. You will appear in the essence of that world. The great soul of Vishnu Yasa. Lord Kalki, the lord of the universe, will mount his swift horse, Devadatta, and sword in hand travel over the earth, exhibiting his eight mystic opulences and eight special qualities of Godhead. Displaying his unequal defulgence in riding with great speed, he will kill the <laughs> this is <laughs> he will kill by the millions those thieves who have dared to dress as kings. Hmm. That's got me thinking, right? Is what's gonna happen? He's gonna kill by the millions? Like is that what is, is this some kind of prophecy of a cataclysmic event? Maybe. We shall see. After all the imposter kings have been killed, the residents of the cities and towns will feel the breezes carrying the most sacred fragrance of the sandalwood paste and other decorations of Lord Vashudeva, and their minds will thereby become transcendentally pure. It seems like a great cleansing is gonna go on, right? <laughs> it seems from that description, Kalki, which is probably a personification of some, it seems like some kind of cataclysmic event is gonna mop up and clean up the the impure souls, and then what's gonna be left is the ones who uh, the ones who have become pure, and they will repopulate the world into the golden age. That's what it seems. I hope it's not like that because that's gonna that's pretty dark, man. But you know that will be done. We we shall see. When Lord Krishna, the, su the Supreme Personality of Godhead, appears in their hearts in his transcendental form of goodness, the remaining citizens will abundantly repopulate the earth. And there it is. The remaining citizens will abundantly repopulate the earth. Who are the remaining citizens? How many are there going to be? That's what I'm saying, man. Like, that's a weird prophecy, right? <sighs> when the Supreme Lord has appeared on earth as Kalki, the maintainer of religion, the golden age of Satya Yuga will begin and human society will bring forth progeny in the mode of goodness. Hmm. Kali Yuga is known as the age of quarrel and hypocrisy. Human society is abandoned virtue and is driven by selfish, selfish interest. Even among religious leaders, there is widespread corruption and people in general have a very superficial idea of what it means to live a good life. As a result, the entire atmosphere is surcharged with conflict from individuals at odds with themselves to nations perpetually on the brink of war. That's a good summary right there, right? But here's the good news. The one remaining virtue in the Sri Bhagavatam, it is described that the religion stands, that religion in, in general stands on four legs of austerity, cleanliness, mercy, and truthfulness. Now in the age of Kali, only one leg of truthfulness remains, and that is quickly weakening. Thankfully, most people at least still recognize that truth is a virtue meant to be upheld in civilized society. Right? Truth with a capital T. We still hold that. We hold these truths to be self-evident. However, by the end of Kali Yuga, even the concept of truthfulness would be foreign to the average person. It's, it seems like we're getting there. It seems like we're getting there. Due to the harsh environment of the age, the process of sex this is this is this is the whole culmination of what what we got to do, right? The process of self-actualization in Kali Yuga is simplified. Our lives are short, and we have a few resources at our disposal for pursuing spirituality. Therefore, Krishna appears in this age as Sri Shatanya, which we already described, to inaugurate the process of chanting the names of God or Kirtan as the best and easiest way to attain enlightenment. 
Hence, the Hare Krishna movement. Hare Krishna. That's it. We already went over the symptoms. Actually, this is good. I, I'm going to go over the symptoms. This is a good summary of the symptoms of Kali Yuga, right? We already kind of went over it, but right here, this is a this is a good synopsis. Okay. So to get through all of this, you just got to remember. You just have to remember, man. Remember your divine essence. Here are the symptoms. Genuine religion will d disappear day by day. Okay, we check that off. It seems like that's what's happening. People will be unclean, untruthful, merciless, short-lived, and weak memory. That's definitely happening. Wealth alone will be the indicator of a person's social status. One hundred on that one. Those with power and influence will escape justice and flout the law. Yep. In place of marriage, men and women will live together simply due to romantic attraction. That's interesting. And you can definitely see that. Most people get in relationships nowadays just because they think they're hot. They th just for, you know, uh, uh, fulfilling each other's sensual pleasures. You know, it's, it goes a little bit deeper than that. The divine union between a man and a woman is a little bit deeper than just being attracted to each other. We can see that in t today's society for sure. Thank you, Tinder. <laughs> Thank you, Bumble and Grinder. The worth of a man or woman will be judged according to their expertise in sex. And there it is. There's another point on that. <laughs> I don't have to go much more into that. Success in business will depend on deceit. Yeah, right? That's business. A good businessman is like trying to one-up the other businessman. Those who do not have money will be considered substandard human beings. You can already see that. Hypocrisy will be accepted as a virtue. Hmm. That one's interesting. Hypocrisy will be accepted as a virtue. I don't know. I have to meditate on that one a little bit. Beauty will be judged simply by one's hairstyle. <laughs> that, yeah, I can see that. Beauty is deeper than the skin, man. It's deeper than the hair. People will think that eating well is the highest goal of life. I think what they mean is that, you know, that's important for sure, but, it's, you know, our, our, it's not the... The body will eventually fade. Eating well is not the end goal. You know, taking care of the body is not the end goal. It's definitely important. I, I definitely I definitely prescribe to the idea that, you know, healthy eating is important, but you know, that's not that's not it, right? Don't become a health freak, a health nut. People will practice religion simply to achieve fame. One hundred percent on that, man. Definitely on that. Shout out the Pope. There will be widespread famine, excess taxes, and people will be forced to flee to forests and mountains. We're getting there, especially with the movement of, uh, uh, you know, what's that? What am I looking for? Going off grid. That's probably going to be more predominant in the years to come. The maximum duration of life will be 50 years. We're definitely getting there for sure. We're almost there. I mean, what is the average lifespan? It's got to be like in the 60s to 80s, right? I don't know. By the end of Kali Yuga, human beings will be reduced size. The Vedas will be completely forgotten and the leaders of society will be thieves. Yep. But we're going to be shrinking, man. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I see that. People will have no other professions than simply cheating, killing, and stealing from one another. That's pretty harsh, but yeah, I can see that. Now this is good, right? What is the purpose of Kali Yuga? This material world is a place of duality. Everything must have its opposite. Good and bad, light and dark, creation and destruction, birth and death. The list goes on and on. Kali Yuga is the age for conflict, strife, chaos, and irreligion. Against the black backdrop of this age, the luminous path of God consciousness appears all the more brilliant. The distinct contrast makes it easier to understand the necessity of spiritual life in this material world, right? I like that. It's a good summation. We have to know how not to be. What isn't God to know God, essentially? Like we need to we need to have the darkness in order to see the light. Yin and yang right there, man. So Kali Yuga, the purpose it seems, is to be a gigantic teaching for us so that we can bring forth the golden age. 
But to me, right, it's like, well, why? Why do we have to go through these cycles? Why do we have to go through... Like, once we learn our lesson in Sati Yuga, what makes us fall? That's what I want to know. What makes us fall back? Is, this, is it a cycle where we fall back into Kali Yuga again, inevitably? What makes us fall back into that? I've heard stories of other yogis actually say that once we get to the golden age of Sati Yuga, that that's it, we've made it and we're good. We're not going to fall back into it. So there's a lot of different models, you know, there's a lot of different ways to interpret this. But I do believe whether you, you know, whatever you want, whatever model you want to ascribe to, we're in Kali Yuga. You know, the description that we just went over, I think was an apt description to the time that we're living in. And when it comes down to it, man, you know, getting rid of even the narrative of Kali Yuga, what you can get from it is that you have to use this world of Prakriti, of Maya, the illusion to know that one, it is an illusion, and two, to use the illusion to be able to see what is not the illusion, to see through the illusion. That's the game. That's the gist of this whole thing. Is don't get caught in the illusion. Use the illusion. Don't let it use you. You know, don't let Kali get the best of you here. And we do that by constantly, constantly remembering. No matter what happens in the phenomena of Kali Yuga. Because obviously, according to this, it's not going to get any less dark anytime soon. But the gist is, no matter what happens, no matter what goes on in this movie screen of life, no matter what the circumstances may be in one's life, whatever whatever which way shit hits the fan, right? Remember. Remember your divine essence. In whatever way you got to do it. If you got to do Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Rama Rama, Hare Krishna, then do that. If you got to play some guitar and that connects you to Ram, then do that. If you got to write, do that. But essentially, how we connect to this essence we don't get caught in the stories. We don't get caught in the darkness. That is, trying to, that is trying to perpetually keep us in a state of lack, in a state of like, you need to be this, you need to go here, you need this in your life. Don't you wish you were this or that? Essentially, we don't need anything. And I think that's what the, the, this world, this illusion of Maya is doing is it's like filling us up so much or it's, it's trying to f it's trying to fill us up to our cup up to realize it's a constantly it's a constantly emptying cup right like you, can, you just keep filling it up and it constantly keeps emptying out it's a never it never fills there's nothing what I'm trying to say is there's nothing that's ever going to satisfy us there's nothing that's truly ever going to fulfill us fulfill our cup our cup of fulfillment. <laughs> and the only thing that will do that is our, our, our remembrance. Whatever we got to do to remind ourselves through the darkness that yes, we are, we are at one with Krishna, with God, Jesus, love, whatever label, it doesn't matter, whatever way the way I would describe is whatever way you want to do, as long as you're not hurting anybody, <laughs> as long as you're not hurting anybody, as long as you're not hurting yourself, that's the most important thing. Whatever way that one has to do it, to tap in and do it. It's that simple, man. We don't need anything of this dark realm that we seem to be thrust into. We don't need anything here, essentially. On the path comes, for me personally, like a sense of, um, I think the word is vairaga, dispassion. Let me look that up real quick. Vairagya? Vairagya. Vairagya. Right? Dispassion, detachment, renunciation of the world. To be in the world and not of it. We all know who said that, right? 
was Jesus. I'm pretty sure it was Jesus, right? I think it was Jesus. Be in the world, not of it. Jesus. My kingdom is not. Uh, I think he did. Whatever. We've all heard it before. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, this is this is a this is a Jesus quote that might be of it, of uh, of that essence. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now, my kingdom is from another place. So you can you can think of it like that. Your kingdom is of an, of another place. It is not of Kali. Our kingdom is the kingdom within. So just be in the world and not of it. And just know this: there's always going to be another phenomenon of life, right? There's always going to be something else that pops up in this Kali Yuga age. Something that always tries to grind our years and take us darker and darker and make us forget our divine essence. But the key is to almost transmutate, transmutate that vibration into a vibration of the highest, the highest renunciation. To reach a state of meditation and make the proclamation of your divine nature. Oh, I messed that one up. <laughs> to, to make the proclamation of your divine nature. That's it, man. Whatever you got to do to remember. It's that simple. And that's the only thing we got, man. That's the only thing we got. You can try and try and try and fill your cup with materialism. Validation from others. Pleasures, sensual pleasures. You can try it all you want. That's the beauty of this life. We have the free will to be able to do that. We can try all we want. But inevitably, all of that is going to come to pass. And we're going to find that that didn't fill our cup. Whatever it is, food, sex, movies, video games, whatever desire, pleasure it is, man, that we think is going to make us, that we think is it, this is it, this is it, this is it, man. Once I get that car, once I get that promotion, once I get X amount of dollars, yeah, that's when I'll make it, man. That's when, when I get the wife and the kids, that's when, that's it, man. No, it's not it. That's not it. And you can still have those things. Like I said, we have the free will to be able to conduct ourselves in any manner we want. We have the free will to pursue these desires. And you know what? Don't let me stop you. Don't let, if anyone's listening to this, don't let me stop you from living your life how you want to live it, right? But just know, just a recommendation from your boy Gary, just know. Those things aren't going to fulfill you. Because they're eventually going to come. Whatever it is, whatever our desires are, our manifestations are, they're eventually going to come. And they're eventually going to pass. So when you think it's it, and like, oh, there goes it. There it goes. The key is to not let Kali tell you what is it. Find out what it is within yourself. Remember it. Remember you are it. And that's all you need. You don't need anything else. And yes, phenomena will, will pop up. Desires, pleasures will pop up. And you can still satisfy your senses. I still do. I still do. I'm not a monk. <laughs> but I know. That's not it. It's going to come and go, whatever it is. It's all going to come and go. So, it's like, don't expect anything. Don't hold any kind of uh, expectation of how the future should go or how the past should have went. Just kind of go with the motions, go with the movie, whatever happens. Whatever you got to do here in this humanly vessel, whatever karma you have to reap, 
Let's go with it, man. Do what you got to do. Do it with love and do it with that essence of remembrance of that Krishna consciousness. And with that, at all, at all moments of your life, whatever you do, if you do it with the remembrance of Krishna, then there's nothing in Kali Yuga that will be able to harm you. It's that, it's that simple, man. It's remember. You don't have to do anything. You know, this path, a lot of people give you certain modalities and practices and things you got to do to get enlightened. And, you know, once you get this, you're going to pass certain jhanas and blah, 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 right? Yeah, maybe that's all true. I still, I still respect certain models of consciousness and stuff like that. But when it comes down to it, man, putting it simply... Simplifying this whole path. It's remember your divine nature. Remember your godliness. No matter the circumstance. No matter the situation. No matter what happens. If you can. Whatever you got to do to remain. At that godliness. At the here and now. And act. And when you're in the here and now. Act out of love. Because that's Krishna consciousness, that's God consciousness, is love, God is love. Act out of love for whatever happens. Treat everything with love, especially yourself. And that's all you got to do. There's nothing else that we have to do here. And honestly, it's not even something that you have to do, right? Like me telling you that you have to do something. You don't have to do that. That's the thing. That's just the natural flow of life. That's just the natural flow of this world, man. The natural flow is is love when one is situated in the remembrance in the constant remembrance there is really nothing to do that's the thing Kali Yuga it almost forces stuff that we have to do and have to be I said this before things you have to do things you have to get especially in the western world but when you remember your God nature, you don't need anything. And a great simplification takes place. Right? Look at swamis. Look at monks. Look at all these ascetics, sadhus. They give up the world. They're the ultimate example of vairagya. I hope I'm saying that right. Of this passion. Because I just think that's a... That's just a natural way that one starts to resonate at while remembering the divine nature. It's th this passion to anything that isn't divine, anything that doesn't serve that remembrance. So monks, yes, even though it was described as Lord Buddha, you know, being atheistic in a way, they're not. They're really not. Because a monk, a Buddhist monk, I mean, any monk, that's their goal of life, is the constant remembrance. It's, it's the easiest way to remember. It's a great simplification of life to remember. So use that as an example for our life, you know? How can you simplify your life to be in the world and not of it? That's monks. They're in the world and not of it to the most extent. It doesn't mean overnight that happens, right? This is a process. This is a process, man. It takes time. Rome wasn't built in a day. But there's no other way. I don't see any other way to find a, a sense of fulfillment, to fill the cup, to truly fill your cup. To truly fill your cup. Man, I don't know what else to say, man. Just remember, remember your divine nature at all times.
Whatever you gotta do to do it. It's always there. So don't get lost in the sauce, man. The sauce is thick. The sauce of Kali. The Kali sauce. It's thick, man. So chant the, the holy name, Hare Krishna. <laughs> in whatever way you go about it. it could be literal kirtan or whatever way that you can tap into this Krishna consciousness do what you gotta do man and that's how we can get through it that's how we can make it home that's how we can make it om om together we're all walking each other home one way or the other and we all gonna make it I don't think I really got anything else to say uh Hope everybody enjoyed. Anybody that watches this in the future. Remember, it's dark. It's bleak. It's chaotic. It's supposed to be that way. It was written. So use the darkness to find the light, man. Remember your light. Your inner light. It's always there. It always will be. It always was. Remember, the kingdom of heaven is within. Other than that, I'm gonna peace out. Don't want, don't got much else to say. I love you all. <laughs>